Um, so my talk is about building a large scale wagtail hosting platform. And uh, this is not just limited to wagtail. Of course, wagtail is just Django as the, I love that line. And um, you know, so this is a, a Django hosting platform and we also have WordPress and a few other things based on our own client support needs. But um, you know, the exciting part about it really is the wagtail part. So, um, so let's just dive right in here. The aviary, um, you know, you have your, your wagtail site and uh, maybe you like wagtail, so you've, you've built uh, two different wagtail sites and uh, you're, you know, you, you want to put them in this nice pretty cage um, and you're going to host your, your two wagtail sites. Uh, but what happens when you have, you know, three wagtail sites, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, you know, uh, your, your uh, aviary will look like, will go from this to looking more something like this uh, pretty quickly once that infrastructure gets out of control. And, um, you know, that's kind of what we, you know, we build a lot of client sites. Most of the sites we build are small. So we build small marketing sites for, for our clients, but we have a lot of them which is the opposite. A lot of shops will have one giant site that they work on. We have many small sites. So the hosting of them is kind of a little bit of a different challenge than what the typical setups are. So um, before we, we talk about uh, building any kind of wagtail hosting setup, let's just talk about the common ways that people do it. And uh, I'm going to exclude like Heroku and Divio for the sake of this because those are pre-built platforms and they're, they're great ways to do it. But uh, let's, I just wanna talk about the kind of the traditional ways of hosting uh, really any Django app. So the first one is uh, the old school. Um, if you've been, a, you've been around the block, you've seen some stuff. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, you know, this is your standard LAMP stack, right? The Linux machine, maybe Apache or Nginx with mod WSGI. Uh, you know, MySQL or Postgres, probably running it on localhost, um, you know, Python, you're just installing it from the system package manager, like uh, any God-fearing blue, true blue American would do, right? <laughs> it's all gone downhill since 2.7 anyways, just being cynical there, but um, this is your, your old school sysadmin talking right here. So, um, you know, this way works great. I've used it, you know, it's a great way. You can throw this up on a $5 DigitalOcean box and it'll get the job done for a small site. Um, so that's one setup. Another setup is uh, the captain. This is a great quote from Moby Dick here. Uh, for there is no folly of the beast of the earth, which is not infinitely outdone by the madness of men. And I think that accurately describes Docker. Um, so <laughs> once again, just being cynical. Uh, so this is the Docker approach. Everything is Docker. You can put Python in a container. Um, you know, it's running a WSGI server. That's in a container. You've got a front end uh, web server that's talking to that. So your Nginx or your Apache is also in another container. Your, your database is in another container. And because you've got all these containers going, uh, well, the containers don't really have any kind of persistent files. They're, um, they're more like static. So for your media files, you are using S3 or some kind of object storage or something. Uh, and this is a pretty typical setup. Once again, you might have a few more containers, you know, maybe you have a Let's Encrypt container or you have some other, you know, process management uh, container. So it's a host a Django site with, um, Docker, you, you might be looking at, you know, running four or five different containers uh, and, and doing that kind of a setup. So the even more, um, I'll say modern approach is uh, what I call the pioneer. Uh, and here's a, I think a fitting quote from the Wright brothers, or Orville Wright, uh, with 12 horsepower at our command, uh, we considered that we could permit the weight of the machine with operator to rise to 750 or 800 pounds. And I think that's a great metaphor for some of our uh, web development apps where you're like, oh yeah, I've just got this little Django site, but now I'm gonna add this integration and this integration and this cloud service and this build and this everything. And pretty soon you have an 800 pound web app um, just because of the sheer amount of infrastructure involved. Once again, this has its pros and its cons. 
there's, you know, this solves a lot of problems and introduces different problems, but this is the total cloud-based infrastructure. So you're using, you know, you are heavily relying on continuous integration, um, you know, container registries, deployments, network gateways, reverse proxies, load balancers, certificate issuers, um, you know, all these, this big web of cloud services, um, you know, database services, Redis, uh, Memcache, Elastic, um, Elastic Cache storage um, uh, services. Yeah, I'm getting my tongue twisted here saying them all. Uh, probably a Kubernetes in there at some point. So, uh, you know, you get the idea of this setup it's a very flexible, it's a very dynamic setup. You can scale infinitely, um, but uh, you know, you're basically using everything but an actual VM. So this is kind of the total opposite of the old school approach. Um, so, okay, so those are three different ways that you could kind of build your, your hosting setup. And like I say, I've used all three of these and they have their pros and cons, um, but that's for one app. So now let's scale it up and see what happens when we have 100 wagtail sites. So 100x old school. Um, now we are managing 100 virtual machines because this was the virtual machine approach, the LAMP stack approach. So okay, that's not bad. We can manage 100 VMs. There's, um, you know, there's very mature solutions. This problem has been around for a while. Ansible, Chef, there's all kinds of tools. Um, it is slow because bringing a V up VM up or down can take uh, several minutes. It's you cannot instantly provision a VM, um, not very easily anyhow. Most of the cloud services, you know, you have to spin one up and wait for that task to complete, and etc. It's it's not an instant process. The other downside is uh, because I'm you know hosting these wagtail sites, I would like to benefit from an economy of scale if possible. Um, and uh, the, with the VMs, you don't really get that. You know, you pay, if you're paying 20 or $30 for a small VM, if you're running a hundred of those, you're still paying 20 or $30 per VM. There's, it's a, it's a linear, there is no cost savings for doing more. Um, so even if they're running at 10% memory, because there's a low traffic, you're still paying for all that VM uh, power. So that's, uh, that's what 100 old schools would look like. Um, 100x the captain. Uh, okay, so this is the Docker setup. And remember, each Docker, uh, each app, each Django Wagtail site is probably using, you know, four or five Wagtail or four or five uh, Docker containers. So uh, 100 of that is actually equal to 400 containers that you're, that you're managing. Um, and once again, media files are still the same problem. So now you're running a hundred different S3 buckets, which, uh, you know, for anyone who uh, likes uh, cores, you know, cores rules, have fun with that. Um, solutions such as uh, Kubernetes or Swarm are no, of no use to you because those solutions are, are pretty much, are uh, primarily designed for running a hundred copies of the same app. So, you know, I'm Netflix and I need a, a hundred dashboards spun up to handle my load. Or I'm Google and I need, uh, you know, a million uh, Google search uh, backends running. But what if I have a hundred totally separate Wagtail sites with totally separate databases? You know, that's not really the problem that Kubernetes is trying to solve. So these orchestration solutions are, uh, you know, they're, they're just not the right fit here. Um, economies of scale. Yes, you can get some economies of scale out of containers because a container runs essentially one process or two processes and uh, it uses a small amount of memory and you can kind of benefit from the shared memory of the host. Um, you know, so if you're running three different containers and one needs more memory, the host can give it more memory. It can take memory away from other containers if they're not using it. So you do get some uh, economy of scale here. Um, the third approach is 100x uh, the Pioneer. So this is the cloud service approach. Um, say you're using a dozen different cloud services to host your app. You're using, you know, storage and uh, proxies and gateways and, uh, you know, continuous integration, Git repos. Say you're using a dozen per app. Now you're up to 1,200 <laughs> different, I'm calling them management subjects, just 1,200 things that you now have to manage for all hundred of your apps. So uh, now some of these cloud services are designed to scale in that direction. So, you know, managing one is just as easy as managing a hundred. 
uh, not all of them scale that way. You know, it just really totally depends. You're, you're really getting really deep into webs of infrastructure at this point. Like I say, you're going to have thousands of different things uh, to be keeping one straight from one client or one website to the next. Uh, economies of scale, usually not because once again, similar to the VM approach, um, you know, they charge you per request, they charge you per gigabyte used. So if you're hosting 100 sites, it's not going to be any cheaper than hosting one site because they're, they're metering you, you know, per, per thing that you use. So uh, it's, it's a very fixed, uh, you know, fixed pricing sort of. So, uh, okay, so those three different, you know, kind of common options, you know, what, what is the best way to host 100 Wagtail sites? Well, the answer is, uh, you know, none of them. So, <laughs> the, you know, Django is a lot different, uh, Python rather, is a lot different than PHP. You know, the, the hosting scenario is just totally different. Um, you know, this problem was solved with PHP a long time ago and with WordPress, you know, you know, mass WordPress hosting is, is very common and very cheap um, because the, those scale problems have kind of been solved. But with Python, it's a little different because you've got WSGI, you need more, you need more infrastructure involved than you do with PHP. So to figure out what the solution is, let us examine the anatomy of a wagtail. So this is kind of the main parts of running a wagtail site. We're going to go all the way from the very bottom, the bedrock, all the way up to essentially the internet. Um, you know, you've got the machine, the OS that's actually running, you know, the computer. You have Python. You have above that, you have the Django wagtail stack. Then you have your custom code. Kind of on top of that, you have WSGI which is this, uh, you know, kind of a black box for most web developers, but it's translating between the web server, you know, and the internet and uh, the Python code. So let's just dive into this here. Uh, the machine, you know, what does the machine give you? Well, it actually gives you quite a lot. Um, you get cron jobs, you get a fast, persistent file system. Files don't uh, just go away when you shut the machine down. They stay there forever until you totally delete it. Um, you get strong user and file permissions, you know, permissions and security and stuff have been baked into operating systems for such a long time uh, that those tools are rock solid. You also get super low overhead. Um, you know, it doesn't cost much to run a machine. Uh, a stripped down Linux distro can run in a few, you know, less than 100 megabytes of memory. Um, and for the, for that 100 uh, megabytes of memory, you get all those things, file permissions, uh, storage, you know, jobs, all kinds of stuff. Um, Python, uh, this is kind of obvious what Python does, but um, you know, Python has one uh, downfall that is uh, often heavily debated at uh, PyCons and whatnot, and that is the GIL or the uh, Global Interpreter Lock. Uh, essentially, without getting too deep into the hood of Python, um, the GIL essentially means that if you want to run two to, um, you know, if you want to handle two Django requests or you want to run two different Python things at the same time, you have to take your code, create a copy of it, and run two copies of your code at the same time. Um, there's no overlap. There's no efficiency between them. You're, you're basically, you know, if you want to run two Python processes of your code, you're doubling the amount of resources that takes. Um, and there's a whole, you know, multi-threading is a whole thing, but for the most part of Django, uh, it's, it's heavily, Django is heavily kind of uh, single threaded because of this gill. Um, while that is, a, a, and generally speaking, a, a downfall for a performance, it, it can be a benefit because we are able to uh, predict resource usage. If you're running two processes, you're using twice as much. If you're running four processes, you're using four times as much. It, it does make it predictable, kind of a silver lining. Um, Python itself is also pretty low overhead, you know, less than 10 megabytes um, to run a Python process, which, you know, for us old schoolers, you say, oh, 10 megabytes, what a waste of memory. But uh, when you look at some of the stuff out nowadays uh, that uses, you know, hundreds of megabytes just to run an interpreter, um, you know, various JavaScript frameworks and whatnot, uh, you know, they, they've just got a lot going on. So Python is pretty efficient in comparison. 
Uh, now we, we get up to Wagtail and Django. Um, these are these numbers are purely just empirical generalizations, but uh, you know, running a Wagtail a site, just a base level Wagtail process serving some pages is gonna run about 100 megabytes of memory. Um, it might be a little less, it might be more depending on what you're doing, but just on average, kind of your standard Wagtail site is gonna use that much per process um, or per, uh, you know, per site that's running. Um, of course, with Django, because of the whole Python gil situation, you get one request at a time. Uh, Django cannot handle two requests at the exact same time. It does one, it does, it does them sequentially. Um, and with Wagtail sites, uh, assuming you have a Wagtail site that's pretty heavily filled out with content, uh, which is a, more of a real world scenario, you might be looking at a total end-to-end -to -end time of 100 milliseconds uh, response time. Now, realistically, that might only be 20 milliseconds of CPU time or something, but um, you know, from end-to-end, -end, it's 100 milliseconds. Uh, once again, these numbers are just totally, um, just kind of observations uh, It vary wildly from site to site. Um, you also have media files in Wagtail, which Wagtail and Django cannot serve media files. They do not do that. It's a feature built into Django and Wagtail that they cannot, um, it's, it's kind of weird when you think about it because they, they have this feature that they cannot actually give you in a sense. Um, so you need something else to serve those. Uh, so that's, one, I, of course, they can serve it. You can make them do it, but uh, under normal circumstances, you, you really should not. Uh, the other thing about Wagtail, and this is certainly worth saying, is that it is relatively well-behaved and uh, bug-free for the most part. Uh, the same cannot be said for other frameworks, especially when you're talking about hosting them on a server environment and uh, you know, a framework decides to just start consuming memory sort of out of the blue and it's, before you know it, it's up to six, seven gigs of memory for serving uh, you know, a single page on a site and you're like, what the heck's going on? Uh, you're not really going to get that with Wagtail itself. Um, it's it's pretty predictable. It's pretty uh, well behaved. And now we get into the custom code. So this is what you're writing. This is what your app does. Um, and this is total wildcard. You know, every app is totally different. Uh, the developer can be allocating a lot of memory, a lot of CPU. They might be accessing the file system. They might be writing to var log because uh, you know some uh, logging module never got updated and it's still hard coded to the var log path or something like that. Um, they might be making network requests. They might be downloading things or uploading things uh, APIs. Uh, you know you have no control over this. Uh, this is the developer. It, this is totally within the developer's control. Uh, naturally, because of this, this is the really scary part um, as a hosting provider because, um, you know, if this part gets hacked or if it's malicious, it could totally wreak havoc on your system um, because it has just full access to everything. Uh, the next layer up in the stack is uh, WSGI. Uh, this stands for, I believe, Web Server Gateway Interface, and this is essentially what translates Python into internet and internet back into Python. So uh, we all know the request object in Django, you know, self.request or just request. Um, you know, that object essentially is getting created by WSGI, which is taking the HTTP request, the text, the packets of TCP IP and turning them into a nice Python object that you can use. So um, because of this, it's, you know, almost always boilerplate, right? We, we never really touch our WSGI files. We use something like uWSGI or gUnicorn because we don't want to write our own WSGI server. Um, you know, web developers do not want to do WSGI. It's, it's a chore. It's not something that you, is really helpful to you at all. But because it is that thing that is kind of running your app um, or handling your app, uh, WSGI is actually, the WSGI layer has an immense source of power um, to control the resources, to manage processes, to do, it can do a lot of stuff. Um, so a very fine-tuned WSGI uh, server can actually totally change the behavior of your Django or Wagtail app. 
And then finally, the, the topmost layer of the stack is the uh, web server. This is Apache or Nginx. Um, once again, this is usually boilerplate. Uh, you know, you're mostly as part, you know, your website is not going to be affected. You know, the, the design and the function of your website is not going to be affected by, you know, how you configure your Nginx. Uh, as a developer, you don't really want to have to do this. You'd rather just have it work. This layer, once again, is also customizable because it can do all kinds of things like upstream caching, proxying, you know, it, this handles the SSL has to be configured correctly. So there's a lot of tedium involved in this um, and a lot of customizability that uh, is really uh, kind of unwanted, but necessary. So, okay, so knowing all of those parts and kind of cross comparing that with the three different approaches uh, I outlined, uh, here's what we ended up deciding to do as the best way, kind of picking the best parts of each. So this is our uh, setup. This is what we ended up deciding on after trying many different ways of doing it. Um, we like the operating system. We like the machine. We don't want to go totally serverless because we actually get a lot of good stuff from the server. So we wanted to keep that uh, operating system files, uh, you know, all that good stuff. On the other end of the spectrum, the web server, once again, this is something that can be configured relatively boilerplate. Um, it's not running your code. It's not doing anything uh, that's related to your code. It's simply passing, uh, you know, passing from one layer to the next. So uh, this is also something that we have a very, you know, custom, customized version of, and it runs on the machine. All the good stuff in the middle, so stuff like Python and WSGI, you know, once again, this we've kind of condensed them into a single reusable container image. So the Python and the WSGI is managed actually not by the developer, but by the host. So, um, you know, when it's time to do a Python uh, security update, you know, 3.7.6 comes out, um, we can push that one container image and manage one container image and that can go out to all of our client sites and they can all get the Python update without us having to touch the code for any of the sites. So that's a huge uh, you know, management uh, kind of tedium win for, for doing lots of uh, these sites. Same with the WSGI, that can be really fine tuned and then set and kind of forget. And um, you know, it will ensure that all of our sites work really well and we're not having to you know, reconfigure our, our platform or, you know, write YAML configs or what have you for every single site that we do. Um, in between is the custom stuff. This is the good stuff. This is the stuff we care about. What version of Wagtail, what version of the PIP packages and our custom code. And really that's all I want to do as a developer. I want to set my requirements.txt I want to write my code and that's the only thing I want to have to manage. I don't want to have to manage anything else. So those are actually not part of the container. That's your code that you store wherever you want. And those files actually live on the persistent, secure, reliable uh, file system provided by the OS. And they kind of get loaded into the container at runtime. So the Python environment is sort of separated from the actual Python code is a way of thinking about it. And this approach has worked really well. So, okay, so we start with this, we scale it up, and we can now run, um, you know, many Wagtail sites. Here I have, what, eight sites. We can run eight separate, totally separate Wagtail sites, totally separate code bases, but they could all be using identical configurations and identical versions of Python. And if we push out a Python security update, all eight of our sites are going to get that update immediately without us touching them. Of course, there's a ton of security involved here to keep these things isolated. I'm not even going to get into the security just for the sake of time. But um, now we scale and we scale and we scale. And uh, this scales pretty well. I'm going to scale even more and zoom out now because that's just one layer. So that's the VM, right? We've created this hybrid VM, LAMP stack, uh, container, you know, kind of hybrid beast that scales really well and is really easy to manage. Um, but that's just, we're talking one server. 
there's still kind of that third approach with the cloud services. We're going to now add in the cloud services that really glue the whole thing together. So let's add in uh, geographies and cloud services. So we can use a cloud. Uh, we're built primarily on Azure, but this can translate to any cloud provider, um, you know, regions. We can run our servers in the regions. Uh, we use backup storage in the region and encrypted key vault. So like all the environment variables and everything for your app are treated as secret level, uh, secret level information and they're stored encrypted in a key vault um, and they get loaded at runtime, decrypted and loaded at runtime. Uh, you know, so that's being handled by a cloud service and some of these, the backups are taken, snapshots are stored for 180 days in a cloud-based backup service. So if a machine totally goes down or if you yourself accidentally delete your files or you know whatever worst case scenario, we've got 180 snapshots to choose from that you can pull it back. Uh, we can immediately pull it back and load it onto a machine very quickly in a matter of seconds. So um, you know that's a cool, that, that's some of the cool cloud services coming into play. Um, but, but we still can't manage it. This is still just a huge beast of infrastructure with uh, no, you know, we need, it needs to be managed. So now comes the management layer. We've actually created a agent that runs on every machine and the agent can totally control the containers. It can control the OS. It can control everything that it needs to control. Um, and we also have the dashboard, which is kind of the stuff that uh, I've been talking about uh, beta. You know, we have a beta going on and you can try out the beta, uh, which is, the beta is primarily the dashboard. The infrastructure is pretty solid, but, um, and now we can talk to things. So the dashboard could say, hey, I have a website. I have a client website. It's located in this region on this machine. Go to that machine and tell the agent to do something. Tell it to apply a security patch. Tell the agent to um, you know, reboot or reload my Python code or uh, pip install for me or create a super user for me or something. Um, and the agent will do it. And that's all controllable from the dashboard. Uh, we also plan to make a, a command line tool as well. But uh, um, so the agents can also talk to each other like a real agent, like an actual person would do, you know, uh, the agents can talk to each other, so I can go to agent, uh, say my, my client site is hosted on a, a server and I need to move it to another server to do maintenance or I need to clone it into a staging environment or I need to move it from one region into another region. I can, uh, you know, tell the agent, hey, I want you to, to move, you know, you talk to this other agent and move it uh, to their system and the agents can work between themselves to, to do whatever they need to do to sort it out. So that is our, our management infrastructure. Once again, uh, the security I'm not even going into here. There's a whole layer of security isolating every little part from every other part. Everything is 100% encrypted, in motion, at rest. The networks, you know, everything totally encrypted. Nothing, not a single site can spy on another site. They're totally isolated. Um, so how did we build all this? You know, how did we, how did this happen? <laughs> um, the answer is uh, magic. Just kidding. A lot of Python, wizardry and a lot of Python. Um, you know, this entire thing is pretty much built in Python. Um, there's a little bit of Go code. We, we wanted to use Go more actually because it's um, exciting and it, this is a, basically the ideal use case for it, but um, it's never a good idea to give a bunch of Python developers, um, you know, say, hey, let's do this really important thing in Go, uh, a language that you don't understand. So <laughs> we stuck to Python and Python actually has really great bindings for doing OS level stuff and containerization stuff. And, you know, Python has really amazing bindings into everything. Um, so I'm just about at time. Like I said, this is in beta. This is the end result, just so you could see what, what it actually looks like is we, we kind of, like, like I say, WordPress has done this for a while. So you have sites like WP Engine or even GoDaddy now is coming around and Kinsta and all these different WordPress sites that it's like, go to a dashboard and click a button and you get your WordPress site. Uh, you know, log into the WordPress admin by clicking this button, those kind of things. And uh, that's not really something Heroku does. Heroku is more focused on giving you the infrastructure, kind of managing the infrastructure. 
uh, that, that is awesome, but we wanted to do something more specific for our needs of Wagtail. So we don't just want infrastructure managed, we want everything including Wagtail to be managed. So I can just say, hey, upgrade my Wagtail, or hey, upgrade my Python, and it just does it without having to worry about it. So that, that's really our need, and that's how we can very efficiently manage many different Wagtail websites without um, having to really do much development at all on them outside of their initial creation. So um, anyhow, that's the end. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, by the way, I'm on Twitter. I have not really been tweeting. I've just been on Slack, but uh, that's my Twitter at the bottom in case you didn't notice. Uh, feel free to connect or whatnot. Um, so yeah, let me go back to my Zoom window here. Um, well, Thank you, Vince. That was, I think that was I really lost great. Thanks, Vince. Okay. Uh, so super impressive what you've built. We're we're a little bit over time. We're just a minute over time. So and there is some discussion and, and questions. But if it's right with the events, I suggest that we you, you handle the questions on Slack. Yeah, sure. We'll do Slack, and I'll be around as well after after uh, lightning talks and stuff too. Happy to talk to anyone. So thank you. Thanks, Vince. It's really great.